the shooting range. In this episode, Pages of History, how Joseph Baerle became a Soviet tanker. Challenge, we're testing the most powerful bomb in the game. And Metal Beasts, a German heavy cruiser called the Admiral Ipper. The update 1.91 brought us a truly legendary ship, one of the most powerful Kriegsmarine cruisers and the lead unit of the class of its own name, the Admiral Hipper. Its development started in the summer of 1935, when they still had to follow the restrictions of the Treaty of Versailles, so the ship's water displacement should have been under 10,000 tons. German engineers were conscious of the fact that further armor augmentation would inevitably lead to the breaking of this line. Happily for them, the National Socialist Party was already in power in Germany, as they were allowed to quietly ignore those restrictions. And the Anglo-German naval agreement basically terminated them completely. So the Admiral Hipper turned out to be exactly as we present it today. The biggest heavy cruiser in War Thunder with a frighteningly devastating firepower. Its full load displacement is just above 18,000 tons. The crew consists of 1,400 people and it speeds up to 32 knots or about 59 kilometers an hour. The main caliber turrets hold eight of the 203mm SKC-34 cannons. There are a total of four turrets that are allocated in a classic German battleship style. Two near the bow and two near the stern. The auxiliary caliber is represented by six turrets with 105mm cannons. The torpedoes are kept in four three-tube launchers, two on each side. And against anything coming from above, there are six 37mm turrets plus a total of 22 20mm cannons. The protection is quite sophisticated, and here we can see the main 80mm belt armor with another layer behind it. So this one is 50mm thick and has a bigger slope angle. Traverse armor, which is 70 and 80 millimeters thick in the stern and bow correspondingly. And the main caliber turrets that are protected with 160 millimeters of armor in the front and 80 millimeters in the barbettes. As for the strategies, the colossal choice of weapons makes the Admiral Hipper quite versatile and lets it fight over any distance imaginable. But there are some things to remember. Firstly, the rounds here are powerful and large, which somewhat spreads their grouping. So if you prefer the largest distances, better stick to HE rounds, keeping the armor-piercing ones for a closer combat to be able to aim directly at the enemy's ammo storages. Secondly, this cruiser is surprisingly quite vulnerable against aviation. You'd think that those dozens of cannons should eliminate any airborne threat. But if you look closer, you'll see that the ship's auxiliary weapons don't have a proximity fuse, only a time fuse. And they're also quite slow to aim. That leaves us with only the 37mm and the 20mm cannons. And they are good, but can only cover a radius of 2 kilometers around the ship. So, you need some good cover to fulfill your battle missions without interruption. What else do you need to be afraid of? Why, the torpedoes, of course! The Admiral Hipper is huge indeed, which makes it an easy target. And it won't always have enough time and space to maneuver from danger. The important thing here is to plan your routes in advance, and yes, this cruiser can take a punch, even several of them. But it doesn't mean you can waste your armor just because you can. So, what's the verdict here? The Admiral Hipper is an extremely powerful ship with outstanding fighting abilities, and it's one of the best heavy cruisers in the game. It needs only two tiny things to shine the brightest a skilled commander, and a little bit of cover play from its teammates. 
The rest, it can do on its own. This story began on D-Day, during the Normandy landings. It wasn't the first rodeo in France for the paratrooper named Joseph R. Bailey. Twice before that, he had been sent to the occupied territories to deliver weapons, ammo and other goods to the French resistance. But those times he jumped alone, playing hide-and-seek with the German forces. And now, the young soldier participated in a massive landing operation. The plan went to hell right from the start. The American planes were getting shot down one after another, and the seaborne troops bumped into the Atlantic Wall, which is a name for the Nazi defense system all over the European coast of the Atlantic Ocean. They couldn't help those Americans who managed to reach the ground and stay alive, but were stranded way behind the enemy lines. Sergeant Bayerle got captured. Then there were prisons, concentration camps, and never-ending escape attempts. Every time he was caught and sent back. And at some point, they even relocated him to Poland to persuade him that from there he would never be able to reach his allies. There was just a tiny little thing that the Germans weren't taking into account. Joseph Berli considered the Soviet army that was coming from the east to be his allies as well. While being kept prisoner, he even learned to say, Ja, Amerikanski Tavarish which meant, I'm an American comrade. So the next time he escaped, he went straight to the sound of the cannons, and then he did what he was trained to do, hid as well as he could near some village and started waiting for the liberators from the first Belarusian front. The soldiers were surprised to say the least. First, they wanted to send the American to the safety of the rear lines, but even after months of death camps, Sergeant Bailey refused to go to hospital. This looked quite impressive, not only for the soldiers, but also for the deputy tank battalion commander, Alexandra Samosenko. Using one of the Soviet low-rank officers who barely spoke any English, he told this woman that he wanted to fight and asked to be enlisted as a crew member of any tank of her choosing. One hour later, the Red Army soldier, Josef Williamovich Bailey, as in Son of William, was provided with rations, a PP-41 submachine gun, and a position of a machine gunner in a Sherman tank that the Soviet army received thanks to the Lend-Lease policy. The battles were hard and bloody. The Nazis literally fought for every stone and every house in Poland. But Joseph was ready for it. Not only was he a great sharpshooter, he was also a skilled demolition man, able to disarm various mines and traps, which came in quite handy. A mere month after his rescue, his Sherman destroyed the gates of that very concentration camp where he had been held captive and from where he had run away. Then there was an air strike, a heavy wound, a military hospital, an intervention into his faith from Zhukov himself, and a happy return to Michigan, where they, all along, considered him dead. The war odyssey of Joseph Bailey was over. He was the only American soldier to fight on both the Western and the Eastern Front. But it's not the end of the story. Meet John Bailey, the son of the famous American paratrooper and Red Army man. He was an exchange student in the Leningrad State University and later became a famous Slavic scholar and an employee of the U.S. diplomatic corps. Moreover, he was a U.S. ambassador to Russian Federation between 2008 and 2012. Talk about amazing coincidences, huh? One of the recent episodes, we found out how many tanks standing in a straight line can be pierced by one of the most powerful rounds in the game. After that challenge, you asked us multiple times about the FAB 5000 bomb. What would be its maximum score? This question is very interesting, but also quite tricky. 
Obviously, the bomb has a huge damage radius that would include hundreds, maybe even thousands of tanks, and the game's engine was optimized to compute quite different situations. So this research task is quite curious indeed. We need to measure all these frags in an unusual situation without stumbling upon the engine's limitations on the amount of models we can put on a map. Before we start the main measurements, we'll conduct a preliminary test. You'll see soon enough why we need it. We need to check how the explosive blast travels away from the bomb and see if the tanks that are closer to the epicenter of the explosion can shield the ones behind them from the damage. For that, we'll place some BT-5s in a form of a cross and drop the bomb right in its center. Now, what do we have? We've 22 tanks destroyed in each direction. Let's write this down and remove the damaged tanks from the map. If there is a screening effect in the game, then at least some of the machines will now get damaged from a bomb dropped in the same spot since they don't have anything to cover them from the explosion. Second blast and nothing. All the tech is undamaged. Okay, now we know that we don't have to account for the screening effect during the main tests. Actually, it would be a thing on more protected tanks, but not in this case. Time to move to the main series of tests and find out that answer. First, let's take a circle with a 50 meter radius and crowd it with tanks without leaving any free spots. Overall, we managed to squeeze 140 tanks inside this circle. Dropping a bomb? Well, of course, <laughs> they're all destroyed. Okay, let's widen the ring up to a radius of 55 meters and remove the machines that were already on the map during this first explosion. That way, we only have an outer ring left. We can do that because we already know that the bomb will destroy those tanks, and we have to also make sure that the tanks closest to the epicenter of the explosion don't protect those standing further from it. Now, we can safely remove them and make some calculating room for the game's engine. Second explosion. All tanks are destroyed once again. Remove them as well and widen the ring once more. 60 meters, 65, 70, and so on to 100 meters. And the ring now consists of more than 280 tanks. Another couple of attempts and we reach a 115 meter radius. Dropping the bomb and missing the center a little bit. Some of the tanks survive. Have we finally reached the limit? All we gotta do is aim more precisely to hit the very center of the circle. Several attempts and we still manage to destroy all the tanks with one bomb. Still, we have to note that even if we miss by only a couple of meters, some of the tanks survive the explosion. If we widen the circle even a little bit, we won't be able to destroy them. Let's sum up. We had the initial circle of tanks, then a second ring right next to it, then another one and so on. Overall, more than 20 circles. Summing them all up gets us to 3,800 BT-5 tanks. That's the exact possible high score of the biggest bomb in the game right now. Before we move on to the next section, let's also admit that all the tanks in the experiment were placed to face the explosion with their frontal armor plates. If we'd wanted to turn them all to face it with their sides, some stray shards would definitely add another couple of dozens of frags in the next ring of targets. But since the overall number is measured in thousands, another couple of dozens of hits can be considered a statistical error. So we, proud with all this mayhem, Move to answering your questions. Christian Ivanov writes about our TOS bombing challenge. This looks like the most ineffective way of bombing anything. Naturally, Christian, that was the point of the challenge to perform something close to impossible. But in reality, this type of bombing has more sense than in the game. The moment we started using computer systems advanced enough to calculate bomb trajectories, even the craziest ones, this method easily went from the most ineffective to really quite effective. Then, there is a question sent by Logan Milton. 
Pages of history for the Phantom II and the MiG-21. Thanks for the suggestion. We'll see what we can do here. A user called Bannon Shale asks, which piston engine aircraft is best for boom and zoom? Hi there. Actually, every rank has their own best aircraft for boom and zoom. But if we need to pick one, all ranks aside, then let it be the Fokker of Wolf TA-152H1, the elegant and effective high-altitude interceptor from the German tree. Another question came from Jenis Shah. Can you explain different evasive actions to take if there's a plane on your tail? Well, this question is clearly too massive to be answered within the Hotmail section. Tell you what, someday we'll definitely make a separate video on evasive maneuvers and aerobatics. And the last question for today was written by Green Iron 2 co 3 What composite armor made of? A compos? <laughs> That's a funny one, thank you for that. Engineers in different countries used textolite, rubber, ceramics, trying to find the perfect balance between maximum protection and minimum weight. Overall, you can call the armor composite every time it has more than one material in it. There is only one exception, though. Air. When there is a layer of air between the steel plates of the armor, this is called spaced armor and not a composite one. That's it for today. You've been watching The Shooting Range by Gaijin Entertainment, recorded by me in Durban, South Africa. So come on, people, subscribe to the channel and press that bell button. Now you gotta leave a like and tell us what you think in the comments below. See you in a week.